Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. Okay, everybody, I want you to hold on to your hearts because this is going to be a wonderful, wonderful interview with one of our um, brilliant, um, well, I would say that normally I would say he's um, in the field of cardiac um, medicine, but he's not much bigger than that. This is Dr. Richard Perryman, who is actually the medical director of the Memorial Cardiac and Vascular Institute at Memorial uh, Healthcare System. And after talking with uh, Dr. Perryman, I have to tell you, we are very lucky to have him here uh, talking about the incredible work that they're doing down there and, and his history of what he's done throughout his life is, uh, is so brilliant. So it's, I never think, Dr. Perryman, of someone who, is, is a, who has been and is a, a pediatric heart specialist as well as an adult specialist. So you somehow were able to marry the two. And I asked him to show me what the size of a little heart would look like. And it's like a walnut. It's not very much, but he's, um, he's here now to really talk about some very important issues. So, Dr. Perryman, um, you know, now we all, we all seem like we're taking this little tiny pill that's a blood pressure pill for something or other. And, uh, and I'm just interested in, in you're, you're, you're young, but you're, you're old enough to know where this whole uh, heart history started. I mean, th- we haven't all been like this. Let's say, let's talk about 40 years ago. What, what was this, the whole heart business like? I mean, I remember when we first had our first open heart surgery, which was an amazing thing. When was that? That was, what, 60 years ago? I don't even remember now. Well, the, the heart-lung machine was developed in 1955. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was really developed for somebody who had clots going to their lung uh, for pulmonary emboli. And it was created not really for heart bypass surgery, but segued into being for, for heart bypass surgery, and that really changed completely what we what one could do for for surgery of the heart because you had a, you had the ability to to support the circulation. Prior to that, there had been attempts of using the adult to to as a heart lung machine for the child, for using f- cooling the body down, a lot of things. But things changed dramatically in 1955 when the heart lung machine was developed and allowed a, a lot of what you see today in terms of the complexity of what's done. When you think about it, you, you were um, reared in England, mm-hmm. and you went to school, you know, thinking you wanted to be a physician. Why did you choose uh, cardiology or the cardiac specialty? Well, to some extent, I think it chose me. I mean, <laughs> I, I, uh, I went to medical school in England, I had the opportunity to be a student for a short period of time at uh, Duke. And I was invited back to Duke by the chairman at that time to train at Duke, not really knowing what I'd locked into because most people would have given their right arm to be in that program at, at that time and subsequently. And it was a heavily weighted program towards cardiac surgery. I mean, that was really the, the premier part of that program. So to get into that really was was pretty natural. And I think I've always wanted to be in the cutting edge of what is done. And that was, at that time, the cutting edge. And it was really the ultimate of, of any kind of surgery was heart surgery. I guess that and neurosurgery were the two that were, were basically the, I don't know if you could call them the glamour professions, professions at that time, but they were the ones that I think to me were the, were the most interesting were changing the most rapidly, uh, and I think had huge impact on people's lives. Yes, and, and today we know, and, and isn't it true that probably heart disease is the biggest killer of people? Absolutely. I think traffic accidents come close, but it's pretty close. <laughs> Too bad. Um, yes, and I think the, the, the problem that the that people have tried over the years to, is to try to isolate what happened, which led us to have this increased risk in heart disease. And it's multifactorial. It's the way people chose their diets. It's 
all the preservatives, it's all the added sugar, it's the sedentary life, people don't exercise anymore, they spend a lot of time on their tablets or in front of TV. Uh, that there are a lot, a lot of factors that all came together pretty much at the same time to increase the risk of of heart disease. I mean, I can remember, you know, my grandparents back in England, they had their, their vegetables, or even my own parents. For at least half the year, the vegetables came from the garden. Uh, my father mowed the lawn by hand, you know, with a, with a push mower, uh, did gardening. Uh, my mother was gardening. I mean, this was just exercise. You didn't think of it as exercise, but it was actually pretty good exercise. And then the food was obviously healthy and it didn't have any additives. Interesting you say that now, because when people wanted to put me on blood pressure, and I said, listen, my grandmother lived to be 95, we have a Hungarian background. My mother lived to be 94. Her sister lived to be 95. You know, and they didn't move around. They didn't uh, They didn't watch everything they ate, but they quit. Just what you said. The food was different. You know, everything was different, the environment. Huh. And so that's what you're talking about that now. Of course, although I always eat organic and I, I'm not exercising enough, but I've never smoked. And we didn't bring up smoking. And I know that's well, like... It's a huge, yeah, huge, huge factor. Right. But, but I'm glad you said what you said, though, in the sense of we, we all really have to now look at our lives and we have to figure out what we could do. And I guess some of us will have to take some medication, which, you know, we talked about that. But what is it that at Memorial, at, at, at Memorial Healthcare, that the cardiac and the vascular institute, what do you do uh, to prevent people having to come there? They're already coming there, but then to come back. So what are you doing for them? I think we try as much as possible to, to educate. <clears throat> and I think you have to look at two populations. You have a population that's already in the hospital, has issues, and they have to be dealt with. I think we can take the example of coronary bypass surgery. Okay, Coronary bypass surgery or putting a stent in with a catheter and so forth is not curative. Okay, it's a, they're palliative procedures to take care of a disease which is atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis is an aging process that is compounded by smoking, by a sedentary life, by diet, by a lot of other things. So we're taking care of the immediate. What is the, what is the situation now? What does the anatomy look like? What can we do to help the patient? That's step one. Step two is how do we now decelerate this process, which is an aging process, and what can we do looking at that patient's medications, lifestyle, diet, all the other pieces, can we do to try and slow that process? Because what we do in that situation is not curative, it's palliative, it's taking care of the situation at the time, whether it's chest pain or whether the heart's not working as effect effectively as it is, or whether you're getting abnormal rhythms because it's not working appropriately. So it's sort of a, a twofold process. What's the immediate? And then what do you do to prevent downstream recurrences or, or problems subsequently? And then you have a whole population, which you know, part of the more health systems uh, efforts in the area of, of the Memorial Health Network is a population health network that manages a large population of people in whom physicians are encouraged uh, to provide preventive care uh, where basically the amount that a patient returns to see the doctor, how the diabetes is, measured, is, is managed, all of these things are measured um, in a way that provides optimum uh, preventive care. Yes, that's what everybody wants. Everyone, I wrote a book called Live to Be 100 Plus in 1990, 1992. And uh, I always believed that people could live to be 100 years old. And I, I know that you're shaking your head and, and I, you can, but they do have to take care of themselves. Yes. It's just not going to happen, right? And you've developed an excellent program now and I've, I've been reading all about it, and you, I think they said that there are over 60 um, physicians in your, you know, in your department, your, your institute, and 
Each and, those, and those are just the employed ones. The employed, there, there, that's there, right. There are, there's a whole group, others who are, who are private physicians. Yes. Who work with us under the same umbrella of the Memorial Cardiac and Vascular Institute, um, all working basically towards one goal, which is to provide quality care to patients. And since you've been in this field for so long, what is the future as far as um, robots or, or artificial intelligence? I mean, do you see anything out there that we don't know about yet? Well, I don't mean I, to put you on the spot, but you're very intelligent. I know you've been thinking about things yes, like this. Yes, I, I think there, there are a lot of things going on. I think uh, the robot in heart surgery has sort of come and gone. Um, it really was a complex tool that really didn't add as much as what it thought it was going to, going to add. I do think that if we're looking at valve issues, there's going to be increasing use of catheter-based valve procedures. We do that for the aortic valve now. The aortic valve is delivered on a catheter. It's deployed with a catheter mm -hmm. and through you know, an incision okay. in the groin. Okay. Um, I think there's, there's, technologically there's going to be more and more of, of that process. I think there's going to be a better understanding. We, we know pretty well what goes on in the coronary circulation in the vessels that we can see when we inject dye, okay? We, we, that we can see and we can get some understanding of the anatomy. What we can't see are the vessels that are microscopic size that are in the muscle that we don't know hmm. they're really what they're, uh, what, what they're capable of at that point in time, okay? And there are some studies that are being developed that some of which we're gonna participate in to really look at what happens in that microcirculation that you can't see when you inject dye in? And what effect does that have on cardiac function, for instance? I think there's, we have some interest in how do we help people utilize all of this data that they're generating with all these devices that they wear now? What do we do with that information? What do they do with that information? And how do we use remote monitoring as a way of uh, looking at uh, how to anticipate patient problems in the future. I think you know, a lot of this is gonna be big data and it's gonna be used in a predictive analytics to try to, try to foresee who is, going to, who is going to be at risk, shall we say, based on a lot of measures that, you know, we're, that are being gathered. Um, we have attempts going on now, we have programs going on now to try and reduce the amount of times that people get readmitted to the hospital. Can we foresee some of those things remotely using devices that transmit data that allow us to say that this person is at risk now for coming back to the hospital? Can we treat them at home in, in some, by some method that prevents them from having to come back to the hospital, which is extremely expensive for them and resource utilizing for us? So can we start using data that's being acquired to help manage patients. I just heard and read about a book that Dr. Tolman, I believe, from Scripps, mm -hmm. uh, was talking a lot about what you were just saying, that it's going to, you're going to be able to measure so infinitesimal what's going on. I'm so happy to hear you say this. I would have known someone like you would be able to do this, but you're right. There's so much out there, and it's, it's scary, but um, someone like yourself must be very excited about seeing where you've been and where it's going. Well, I, you know, I'm always, I'm, people always joke that I, I sort of bring historical <coughs> perspective to things because I've been around a long time. <laughs> um, Which is good. And I remember uh, uh, back uh, at late, in the late 70s when I was a resident at Duke, Dr. Longmire, who at that time was chairman of surgery at UCLA, came to talk about a early project that they had embarked on with IBM to try to look at the, play, the role of the computer in medicine. This is the late 70s. And back then, of course, the memory was 
rooms of memory and they kept, kept adding another room of memory. But his premise was that medicine up to that time was a record, an observe and record science. You make an observation, you record it. But that observation may get repeated and repeated and repeated, and people make the same observation, but there was no way of analyzing that observation mm -hmm. to come back and say, what can we've learned? What have we learned from all these observations? So that was the first attempt to try to computerize, use computers to try to collect information to be able to analyze it in a way that you can't do. You can do, but it's extremely meant to do it manually to go back and look back all through all this piece of information. So although the medical record, the electronic medical record is not the panacea that it was thought to be, I think, at the, f at the beginning, is allowing review of data to be done more easily to try to look at can we predict with this kind of behavior what is likely to happen for someone? No, that, that's phenomenal. That's exactly where it needs to go. I just want everyone to know if you've just tuned in, I hope that you've been listening. But um, uh, it, it's a wonderful thing to have someone like uh, Dr. Richard Perryman uh, on our show because it just starts to tempt you uh, of what is out there. And he is actually the chairman of the um, pediatric, well, let me just say, uh, it's Memorial, he's the director, the medical director of Memorial Cardiac and Vascular Institute, and we're having a, a grand um, conversation, at least for me, to hear someone of his reputation and of his um, background to talk about what's happening right here in South Florida. I mean, we don't have to go to UCLA or to Harvard or some other place. We have it right here. And it's interesting that I started about 10 years ago, Dr. Perryman, uh, the Cure, a Cure Sympo Medical Symposium. It's called Cutting Edge Understanding Research and Education. Mm -hmm. And I've had 10 to 12 distinguished physicians, whether from the University of Miami or Scripps or other places, talk about different subjects, just like what you're saying, because the general public has no idea about this. You know, they go to their doctor, the doctor gives them some pills and they go on. But to to know that there are people like you with such a vision here, right here in South Florida, is ex extraordinary. And that's why I'm sure they found you and made you, gave you this position to be able to uh, encourage people and to enlighten them. And it's, it's a pleasure to have you on our show today. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky because I've, I've had uh, tremendous support from the administration who have put an enormous amount of resources into... Uh, providing really the ability to be able to provide top-class care. For instance, our cardiac surgery program, we, we, give, we send all that data to the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Uh, every, pretty much every program in the country does do so. We've chosen since 2010 to publicly report our data. So you can go on the SDS website, you can look up our data, and they've worked with Consumer Reports to ascribe a, a star rating so we've been a three-star cardiac surgery program since 2010 when you could publicly report that data. Uh, we remain a three-star program. There's about, that's about 1% of the programs in the country. Um, we have an we have a, uh, adult congenital heart disease program, which up until a month ago was the only accredited one in Florida. There's now two accredited. But there's only about 20 in the country that are accredited, right on people's doorsteps here for for patients who have uh, congenital heart disease who are now adults. And there's more adults with congenital heart disease than there are children now. Would you explain uh, congenital, please, in, in layman language? Somebody who has, has an abnormality of the heart that they're born with. It's the holes in the heart, uh, an absent vessel, an absent chamber, uh, some of the, the congenital abnormalities that you're born with, which we are very good these days at managing uh, surgically. I think if you looked across the board, it's about a one to 2% mortality, which is amazing with the complexity mm -hmm. of what's operated on these days. But those are patients who are growing into teenagers and then they become adults and then they leave the pediatric environment. And hitherto they were basically either lost or they went out into uh, into the public, into 
uh, general practitioners or adult cardiologists. Uh, they were scattered around. And they didn't reappear until they were many times pregnant. So we get patients coming in who have residual congenital heart disease who are now pregnant and need high-risk OB people and cardiac anesthesiologists and so forth to deliver them. Or they come back with arrhythmias. And so you have a electrophysiology team that is very adept at dealing with all aspects of arrhythmia. They come back with heart failure, in which case they may well be either may well, may well be transplant candidates, or they come back because they're cyanotic and they've got, they're turning blue again and they have issues that need to be resolved. So the aim is to try to manage these patients in a way that you can hopefully head off some of these episodes and not have them showing up when they get acutely ill. And that, to be able to do that, you have to have, as we do, the combination of a pediatric and, a, and an adult mm. staff, cardiology staff, that can really take care of, as I, as I mentioned to you earlier, basically the fetus who has congenital heart disease all the way to the 105-year-old who needs a, trans, a, a catheter-based valve. And we can do all of that with no gaps, including all of the interventional procedures, all of the surgical procedures, transplant, pediatric and adult transplant, artificial hearts, basically, acute support for patients who go into cardiogenic shock and need to be mm. on a support for a while while they recover. So I'm very lucky that to have the opportunity to oversee a very talented group of, of physicians, support staff that have been... Uh, that have been provided to help do that. And we didn't get to the three-star program with, for surgery just because we have really good heart surgeons, which we do. But we also have round-the-clock cardiac intensivists who are managing those patients post-operatively. They're not being managed from home. They're being managed by physicians who are on site. We have uh, 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 advanced practitioners who are in-house taking care of those patients. A lot of things of, of, of support that need to go in to create that kind of a, a program. And I'm, I'm fortunate that Memorial has, has seen fit to support those programs and the, and the resources that it takes to build heart transplant programs, to build ventricular assist device programs, to build interventional uh, uh, electrophysiology programs. The equipment for electrophysiology is extremely sophisticated now. It's almost like looking at a Star Wars display. and uh, But you need it in order to, to provide the, the most accurate care. I once had one of your electrophysiologists on, at my CURE program, and he brought the little, you know, little apparatus and everything, and he talked all about it. But I, I'm glad you brought it up because I really have not... Uh, the congenital has not been something in my brain. I've not really thought about it. And I thought if you repair something, it's over. But you're saying... Once they're born this way, even if you've done things to help them, it's always there. I didn't know that. Well, and I, th I think it varies a little bit. It depends what you have. If you've got, if you had, let's say, a hole between your collecting chambers and that was closed, you're pretty much cured. Okay. Most, there are some, several things where if you've got an abnormal vessel between the artery that goes to the lung and the artery that goes to the body and that's tied off, you're cured. That's not an issue. But I came from an era where I think we probably did some patients a disservice because we were happy that patients survived uh, and we sort of gave the impression that in many cases they were in fact cured. We didn't say that but I think that was the mm -hmm. impression that many times families got. And I think um, what we have realized is that some of the things that we thought were kind of innocuous and probably weren't going to be uh, an issue did turn out long term to be, uh, to be an issue. And as we, as we start to do even more complex procedures and you have these patients who now have only one pumping chamber and that they've been re-plumbed sort of to allow the, the blood to get through to the lung without being pumped, those, those patients need a lot of follow-up over time. Mm. Uh, a lot of the things that we do need, need follow-up. Um, and some of the things, as I said, that we thought were kind of innocuous, like a leaking valve you know, in, in a repair that was repaired going to the, the artery going to the lung, we thought really didn't create much of a problem, but now we find it does. 
And these patients are coming back uh, later when they're adults, uh, and they and they start to need care again. So we're trying to offset that those problems by following them out of pedi- out of the pediatric age group into the adult age group. Well, this is really a very important. Uh, I think I'd love to have an article on this because I'm sure people don't realize that this is that there is a place now that they can go and be cared for, watched, and and controlled. Uh, I did not know it was such a, a large you know population, but it, it is, and it's and it's and it's growing exponentially because so many children with who were born that get operated on or intervened with, with a Catherine intervention, uh, are making it to adulthood. This is amazing. And, you know, <laughs> Dr. Perryman, I am just so thrilled that you took the time to come here in your busy schedule. I'd like to have you back a lot more times. We'd like to see articles from you. Dr. Richard Perryman, um, he, is the, uh, he is actually the medical director of the Memorial Cardiac and Vascular Institute down there in... Uh, well, it's in Broward. It's South Broward, I have to Correct. assume. Here, exactly. And um, you can look them up um, on the website, uh, on their website. But uh, it, it's really, let's see. So if I'm looking for your website. It's um, what, do you know what the website, it would probably be a memorial. It's mhs.net. Yeah, mhs.net. Uh, back, back, uh, slash heart. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you so much. We. Uh, it's just been absolutely wonderful to have you here and i'm going to be able to pick your brain more and more it's a it's a perfect joy for for our audience to hear so many of your well, delight your, to be yeah, here and I'd be, thank you i'd be honored to be asked to come back at any oh time. yeah we'll do that and, and we'll, if we could get you to write some stuff a lot of this okay. you know in an article for us too so thank you again and and we um we certainly applaud what you're doing down there and and hope that you keep keep doing that Well, thank you for the opportunity to to talk to you. Yes, Dr. Perryman.